This conference will now be recorded. August 12, 2024, City Council meeting will come to order. Please stand for the pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. First item on the agenda is the consent agenda item. The concrete path for the dog, how big is that? She's pointing off exactly how big it was. I don't know actually, but I'll find out. Uh, did you take bid on that at all? Yes. And the um, fence, I mean, fences from the Windsor Farm, then how many feet are those? Do you know? Uh, I don't know off the top of my head. Brian, do you know? The, the fences were. How many feet along with it? Out on the link? Yeah, yeah. on the link, yeah. Not on the front. Yeah. Privacy, meaning the limbs are really into the sidewalk, is that correct? Yeah, the yeah. 100, 120 feet each side. And then I'd also like to pull out C, one C, because the wording in that is not correct. And we should discuss that. Okay. My concern is that if we say in section four, if we call the question uh, of the motion of accident sales tax, general purpose retail sales tax, that thing never passed. I think it should be specific to a certain cause. So, why not? Are you asking me the question whether? Well, no, I mean, I think when the public sees a general purpose, it's just they don't trust government anyway. It sounds like a slush fund. I mean, that's what I would actually look at it. The difference in, and we kind of talked about this on a couple of occasions, is we have, we have capacity in general purpose sales tax and capacity in the special sales tax. So they're two different measures. But one is the general purpose that we will then use, it sounds like, at your direction, that when we collect the general purpose sales tax, that we will then transfer that to debt and we'll then actually talk about the mechanism that we'll do that tonight. But then there's the special sales tax. They're actually two different things. So that's why you have to have two different uh, legislative acts, if you will. I understand that. Right? I just thought about the wording. When the general public looks at the wording, if I saw that, I know what it's for. I would be suspicious. 
No, I, I, I appreciate the, the input, but this is this is legal language I've done by our bond attorney and all that. I know it's legal language. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm just throwing that out there because the general public basically doesn't trust the government. <laughs> And this, what we're doing in advance, is publishing as far in advance the agenda for this particular special meeting of the transparency. Because if you understand that we have another regular meeting, and then on the heels of that, we have this meeting. It's only a couple of days apart. So we thought it would be somewhat preemptive and transparent to go ahead and publish this publicly uh, in advance of that meeting, and then have some, you know, have enough time that people can read that. And then I think the other piece of what you're suggesting is that that's what the education piece is. I've seen some of the uh, material that we're putting together to educate the public, and the verbiage in that will explain this better. I don't have it in front of me, but it's, it simplifies that this is intended to collect this particular sales tax as a general purpose. However, our purpose for it would be to collect it. And then we would use it to pay off uh, use of that those sort of things. Well, why is it not going to have to get all the language in the way of the Well, that's, that's because it's a general purpose. It's statutorily that we're doing what it is statutory. We have a better chance of passing that if we can end the resolution And that's a question I can, I can get answered for you if there's some way to change that. This, but I, I think. That's been vetted two or three times. We've, we've gone back and forth with bond council, and it's framed up with the statutory language. That, that's, so that's my suggestion. The legal council's here as well. Uh, we think that it's the perception. You know, I mean, I don't know if anybody else agrees with me or not, but the perception of the government not doing, saying specifically what this no tax is for, puts a lot of suspicion in people. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, it should be, it should say, if it's going to go to death, it goes to death. Right. Yeah. <coughs> Mr. Gerber is suggesting this kind of what I preface, which is the capacity. We don't have the capacity to do all of it. It has to be split because we simply don't have the capacity statutorily to put this under one special sales tax or one general purpose sales tax. We have to do both of them. Right? It's not what I'm asking. It's not what I'm saying. I, I understand what you're saying, which is more of an education piece in the sense of using certain language. My position would be we receive this from legal counsel, and I think it complies with the statute. And I think that's what we have to do. The other piece to counter that, if we can, is through education of what we intend to do with the general purpose sales tax revenue that we might receive. All right. So would the question for bond council be could we list in our resolution that we you want to take out general retailer sales tax? I just think it would pass easier if it was your mark or something you know, other than explaining the, the purpose yeah. of it. Because the there is a a um, Attorney General election or uh, opinion regarding how the sales tax um, is actually phrased on the ballot. But correct me if I'm wrong, if we went to bond council and just took the check, what if we have any um, wiggle room as far as how we can amend on the ballot? Because I think the, the public is used to, like with the constitutional amendment, there's an explanatory statement that's specifically allowed for in the constitutional unit um, process. And that could be subject to litigation if it's misleading or something like that. Um, but on this, the earmarks, the concern I would have is whether the earmark would be are we saying that we won't do the formal amendments? Um, because if, if we say it's only for this, then that could constrict our ability to use it for the actual purpose. Sales tax statute says it in, in oh, yeah. PSA 12, 187. 
The city shall impose a retailer sales tax on the provisions of this act. Um, without government by such the city having first submitted such proposition to the procedure of legal or monitoring of the collectors of the city building thereon. So the question of a retailer sales tax, at least the retailers, is part of it. Um, it's what we're kind of involved with in that special authority. Um, but as far as the purposes, I, would, I guess my question is only out of time in any way to ask that question on. What, what we're doing here is just simply somewhat in advance adopting the budget. You, or, I'm sorry. The uh, resolution or the I'm sorry the agenda for that particular. What you don't have before you is the resolution. So the question then becomes: Is there a language that we can put in the resolution that can clarify that for you? Come time at this particular meeting that you would have that would offer those explanations. So what we're doing here is just adopting the agenda specifically that we have to specify exactly what we're going to entertain on the agenda for a special meeting. Has to be very specific. So, so by, by the time this testing comes up, it can change the land use to work more favorable to the public. Not on the item, not on the item, item but certainly the, if, if it's possible. Well, and if right. long council is available, that, that may be a way to do it if you turn the long council to the public. I just, I just, I just want the public to form, and I don't want to get, you know. Right. Mark, on the uh, we had a special meeting on July 17th mm -hmm. to the ordinance for the resolution to act on resolution 2024. There's confusion in my mind of what we actually approved in that resolution, and then the July 22nd meeting on the consent agenda items we approved minutes of that meeting and I've looked and I have not ever seen the minutes that were recorded at that meeting and I'd like to request a copy of those minutes. Well I can certainly do to we we should have adopted that on, at the last meeting. It was it was it was in the consent again mm -hmm. to adopt I think it said adopt resolution twenty twenty four that there's confusion in my mind on what motion was actually made according to that resolution when the motion was made to lower the mill levy by one. And there was no mention of resolution number 2024 in that motion. So I'm confused on whether we are going to exceed revenue neutral or if we are locked in on that. We need some legal on that to clear it up in mind. Because as far as I'm concerned, we did not adopt that resolution properly, and we are in revenue neutral. I looked at this a, a little bit. I was in that, that special meeting, um, so I agree with it. Um, I did later via email on what our exact responsibilities were um, under the revenue neutral statute. And we're, the county body bureau needs to give notice to the county code of its intent. And so I think ultimately that can probably be done by consensus with, without a resolution. This is relatively new law, um, but the, the public notice and the will of the body to exceed that is what's operative. And the revenue neutral law is not necessarily the most perfectly drafted sometimes, and we're still figuring out what it means and what's strictly interpreted by courts in Alberta and uh, Board of Tax Appeals and what's, you know, really <clears throat> a, a process type thing that it's pretty close to. What I do know is that under the statute, we have to give notice. And that notice was given by staff in accordance with the body's, uh, at the very least, consensus. It doesn't use the word resolution in that particular 
part of the, of the process. But it's, it's not to say that it couldn't be challenged. Um, but the, the body um, can enact what I would consider a, an administrative um, enactment. It could be seen as more of an administrative act that the body to give notice of an intent versus the actual pass law. Um, and Which to me is only intended to do by passing the resolution, but we didn't have pass the resolution. And if the statute said, shall pass a resolution, I think you're not going to uh, throw the water. Um, since it does say give notice, and the idea being that the Council has a public meeting, um, giving consensus to authorize staff to do that. Whether the resolution is operative or not, I don't think changes the, the consensus nature of what happens. Um, but we need a concrete answer on this because we're in a green room. As far as I'm concerned, yeah. there was a deadline on this that Saturday at me. So are we really neutral? Or can we repeat the definition? My, my opinion at this point is that the statute can pass. Because notice was given, because of the, at the backing of, <coughs> of, the, of the council to give notice about where staff could notice, that there's nothing in the statute that does not comply with to, to move the train down the track. Now, in the future, if there's, <coughs> you know that if you don't hold a hearing on a specific date, in the county clerk's um, notice that just went out to all taxpayers that when you run the hearing comes down to the county clerk's office, um, that that can be a fatal error and there's some government bodies that have passed out on me because they say they didn't show up or they tried to make sure that the case. So we don't, there is no precedent for saying that consensus alone is not enough to be allowed to proceed. There was no mention of motion the motion was exactly this that I made the motion to cap the mill levy at 39 point plus whatever it was a mill less and there's no mention of revenue neutral in that motion. No. Which is why I asked for a copy of the minute here that we approved but I never seen it because they were in the consent agenda. And sometimes we don't go to the consent agenda to find good stuff. They consider that to be kind of where it needs to be and to me I need to know. You know, I'm sitting up here trying to make decisions in all financial with the city. And I don't know. I'm not sure. We start doing something now and we are not to exceed revenue neutral as we are, then he's in trouble too. Right. And it's if they're high stakes because you don't yeah. find out. And I don't want to be involved in those high stakes. I want to know what's going on. I hope the rest of the council understands. I mean, the, the only, the, the process at this point would be you do ultimately adopt the budget and set a rate that's in excess of revenue neutral. Um, given notice of the hearing, given notice of the intent, the question is whether the actual framing of the, of the motion, and if, if there's any time for discussion, if that amounted to their authorization to proceed, give you notice to proceed. And once you adopt, Set, then it could potentially be subject to a challenge or vote of our citizens. Um, but to say that we're not properly adopted in the green room because there, there isn't a way to put a bag of bottle at this point and to pass the proof to us in the hearing. I think the best practice, obviously, is to be to hold the hearing and vote on this. This question may inform your vote. On the budget, because if you ultimately or no way, because if you ultimately decide to pass a budget that you're that you're then being underfunded on because of legal questions, then, then that would be something to consider to open up this hearing. But there's nothing we can do with that now. What happened happened, and, and notice was given. Just because it's talked about in the discussion doesn't mean it doesn't mean that it's 
part of motion. The motion clearly stated to cap the mill rate, mill levy, one mill rep. No mention of revenue neutral at all. It doesn't uh, matter what we're talking about out here. It's all about the motion. And the debt. And the heavy units are very important in this meeting, and like I said, um, one mill less than the proposed rate that was under discussion. So that would be my first question is, is the proposed rate part of that? Because by default, obviously, a rate that is already exceeding revenue neutral, one mill less than that, if that's still revenue neutral, I think very easy or lower and very easy to express to clients and be backing up the rate that is clearly in excess. So where are the minutes? Where are the minutes in that special meeting? Well we can get them. Did you just now requested them or did you request them previously? I have not because I didn't you know I didn't have this in front of me again so I just I need to know. Then a question in my mind about the revenue neutral from the get go. They were in the 22nd. Yeah, I would like sometime in the next few days. They were in the 22nd. <laughs> if we get these packets too late, we'll be able to pull them back. If we get these things at 2, 3, 4 o'clock on Fridays, it's not enough time to try and do research on this. So that's, I'm just kind of complaining a little bit. I think it's better. So thank you for the explanation. And I'm not sure I'll copy those. And after, after you get those minutes, if there's anything that I can actually provide additional analysis, I would like to get involved in some of it. I'm bringing the back to the question is, is the agenda and the uh, number one. Consideration of the consent agenda we pulled out. Uh, the statement of the bill is just for questioning about the length of the fence, if I recall right. And there was one other uh, did they go off the fence for a concrete pad and the fence? And the, and the fence. Did right. you ask the question about the fence as if it was bid or not? Well, I asked about the concrete pad. And He's going yeah, to teach it and find out. Yes. He has an answer, Mr. Bishop. So, so we did not go out for bid because the concrete was three thousand dollars and the kennel fencing was nineteen hundred. Uh, we used the previous vendor because they were familiar with what was needed, and the size was ten by twelve. No offense. Next time, you can't invite me to visit. I think three times more of that concrete than I got it nine dollars. Suggest that maybe, <clears throat> but since you pulled them out, I think you have to entertain them. Okay. That's probably the best way. We have the motion for consent agenda item 1A. <clears throat> Cox? Yes. Mullen? Yes. Bishop? Yes. Mullock? Yes. We have a motion for consent agenda item 1B. Motion to approve. Second. We have a motion for consent agenda item 1B. Second. We have a motion for consent agenda item 1B. Second. We have a motion for consent agenda item 1B. Second. We have a motion for consent agenda item 1B. Second. We have a motion for consent agenda item 1B. Second. We have a motion for Mullen? Yes. Bishop? Yes. Mallott? Yes. We have a motion for consent agenda item 1C. 
motion to remove from the agenda. Second. And a motion by Council Member Barone. For removal. For removal. Okay. Schreiber. No. Adcox. No. Mullen. No. Bishop. Yes. Mallott. Schreiber? Yes. Adcox? Yes. Mullen? Yes. Bishop? No. Mallott? No. Moving on at this time, we'll accept requests for comments from the public. And please remember to state your name and your address. You have three minutes. When you get close, that will hold up your time. Okay. My name is Dave Johnson and the Portable Five South Hunter Tech Terrace of Brazil, Kansas 66111. So, uh, I, uh, if the city didn't uh, reach out to KDOT about the uh, medians at uh, K32, 435, I want to publicly recognize my wife, Joe Allen Johnson. Back in January, she wrote a letter to KDOT. And on February 1st, you got a letter from Robert Fuller on uh, stating that, you know, they would look at the medians. And then, as everybody knows, uh, in June, they were going at it. And those medians look spectacular compared to the way they were. You know what I'm saying? And so, my wife, I just want to credit her, and uh, she shot it. A little bit better. So, uh, anyways. <clears throat> Which, uh, you know, so the rest of K32. I don't know what happened to the lawnmowers. The lawnmowers. I don't know what happened to the street sweepers. Falling rock. The falling rock on the uh, north side of K32. It looked like one of those rocks even caused an accident. There's oil and glass around that thing. So I don't know what's going on with k -Dot. So I'm kind of going to, going to, you know, see if my wife will write another letter. But, uh, so K32, I mean, this is our town, and, uh, you know, you drive through it, it looks like a tundra. So, I kind of want to you know, throw that out there to the uh, council. And, uh, so, on Facebook, there was a thing saying, uh, on 717, there was a one million grant given to Wyandotte County. Farmers Ranch and Evansville for uh, road safety improvement. Uh, I'm just kind of wondering if Evansville get any of that money and what is the plan? And I would like to throw in there on 107th Street, which is the main collector road from K32 to Edge Hill, with the exception of uh, a couple hundred feet that got paved three years ago. Is in terrible condition, and I just want to keep try to keep 102nd Street between K32 and Edge Hill on the uh, map of uh, getting paid because it's, it's it's not a it's not a neighborhood road, and it's, it's, it's a it's a primary main road, and uh, so uh, <clears throat> my subdivision gives some love, Edge Hill subdivision, and I just really appreciate that. I want to say thank you. You want to get now? But uh, so anyway, so I, I think that uh, I think it's coming. Thank you.
Uh, thank you, Council. Look out for you on item number three. As I stated, this is a change order, the second change order in the project, the 104 Street uh, sidewalk project. This is specific to uh, drainage and a retention wall, about 51 inches long. Uh, originally, it's directly across from the south entrance of the cemetery. There is a drain pipe that goes under the road, and there are long, long back. When we removed some large rocks, if you will, that were at the end of that pipe, we had to extend the drainage pipe about 10 feet to accommodate the sidewalk going over the top. So removing that rock that we had placed in there some years ago, uh, that revealed it was a fairly deep uh, ravine, if you will, uh, and as well as it needed that retention. That retention was placed there deliberately to help with the erosion. So this wall for $12,200 is number one for erosion control, and number two, it will, it will be above the sidewalk enough that it adds some, some degree of safety as well. Uh, cause construction as part of the sidewalk build, and, and that floor uh, has agreed to do that for the $12,200 something that we, it's necessary to we'll cover at the end of that pipe and protect that as well. Erosion control and safety. So that's the intent. <coughs> Is that going to take care of the water that was running between the two houses? Will that particularly take care of it? will be a part of assisting that. If you recall, there was a large brush, like bushes, and these big, I think they were limestone blocks, don't quote me on them, but they were large. And that was a part of that kind of surface control for the water shedding. This will serve that same purpose. It will just be in the form of a concrete wall. It'll be one aspect of it. Where will the water flow now? The water is now, because there's an added, uh, you know, somewhat curvy surface, uh, would, would flow over the top and rope down towards that pipe. So this is intended to stop that top surface erosion. The pipe is still there. It's below, and it still flows as it should uh, as part of that kind of watershed property, if you will, by design. Now, there's another piece that we've been exploring, of course. Uh, it's been, been some time in the work since we started the project, which is a whole different item than this, and we're not ready for that. But in the sense that there is going to be more surface shedding design, a better design than what's there now that will carry a higher volume of water down to the, to the cul-de-sac, which is, has been always there uh, since they designed and built that, and that, that carries down the storm drain, but then carries it farther down south and all that stuff. So there's, that's part of an overall drainage plan that will come next. Can you see Rosa do the scene? They did the engineering, didn't they? They did. Can you see this problem coming up? I think, if, if, if you recall, it's, until you're standing right here, you, you don't realize that how deep that particular pipe really is with that very, very large stones on top of it. They were stacking it pretty deep. So it's just a matter of, uh, the, the design for the wall was after the fact of the 10-foot pipe extension. Uh, now, the 10-foot pipe extension, then that's what was needed to run the sidewalk over the top of it. Uh, so you have a you know, just shoot a straight line, that sort of thing. So once that was done, we realized, okay, that's going to need that retention put back. And this is just the design for that retention. It's crazy because these guys do this every single day, and they're trained engineer. They look at stuff every day. It's possible that it was missed. Yes, it certainly wasn't in the design. And, and I think as we were all there, we saw that these rocks were moved and what it was going to take to uh, you know, have the sidewalk front over this pipe and the extension and stuff. That's when it was decided we should design the wall instead of putting any kind of the, the rock back, for example. But, but this was the best thing. So this, this is the second time that we've had a problem we were on 102nd Street. They did that project over there. We had to come back and spend a whole bunch more money because it dropped off. And they're losing confidence, man, in BBC Roads. And I we used to use them all the time in Murray there. But you know, it's two projects right in a row. There's been you know, extra money spent because something's over there. This money comes out of that park on the Well, this will be from our drainage.
part of our drainage improvement. Uh, same money that we used for the 102nd Street drainage project, we'll use from there. And we'll also do that for the uh, storm drainage, the swell, if you will, that will be up a top watershed, if you will, uh, between the two houses that you can refer to. That will be the same fund. Well, then down the bottom, where that I know where we're talking about there, and we know the creek people that we're talking about, where that extension is. So, what about down the hill to the south, where they're putting in the new culvert or the drainage or whatever? Is that going to be added on to this also, or is that already taken care of financially? You're referring to the inlet that's farther would be south. The one that's cut up like this. Yes, it's down. being rebuilt. It's a part of the project. It's all included already. I got to ask, where does that water go? Is a good question. I think it flows similarly. That Does it go to that retention pond? It, down yes. I, without looking at the plans, I would say common sense would tell us it all flows downward. That's, that's financially, that's taken care of. It is, absolutely. It's, it's included with the project. I'm making a motion to approve the request of $12,200 for the repair of that. It's been a motion from Council Member Mullat and a second from Council Member Mullen. Please call roll. Shriver? Yes. Adcox? Yes. Mullen? Yes. Bishop? Yes. Mullat? Yes. Item number four, consider a bid award to for the repair of the fire station and police station lift. Thank you, Council. What we have before you is item number four, the background information. As we know, uh, we had a hailstorm. Uh, it did damage the police roof. And the fire department roof, as well as other roofs. We, uh, these are all coming in somewhat in the insurance aspect of it, a little spaced out. Uh, however, these two particular buildings are in review for insurance proceeds, uh, but we, we think we need to move sooner than later because specifically the fire department roof is in much poorer shape. Uh, people are there 24 7. Uh, the, fire, uh, the police station. Just, just as needy with all of the, the people in it as well as all the equipment and things like that. Uh, and one thing about these two particular roofs, they're unique. Uh, we've had we had local, if you will, uh, you know, licensed with the city roofing companies come out and look at that, and they couldn't provide a bid because it was out of their qualifications, if you will. So we had several of those. So what we did, because we don't know the specifications and we didn't know how to put the bid out for ourselves. This is a part of our municipal complex pro project, aka the town center, uh, that we called on our construction management team to then uh, put together a team of engineers, which was necessary also for our insurance company. They wanted specific engineers to come out and look at those and give a report on them as well. So we uh, they, they facilitated that. They, they looked at it. Uh, they, they devised the specifications. They went out for bids. They sent us the bids. And they made a recommendation that JR and company was the lowest and best bid, very qualified to do this kind of work for both of them. What's unique about the police department, it's a membrane of sorts, but what needs to be placed over it is some of the liquid, then it becomes a membrane. And so it's a little unique, but it's a little less expensive. And it probably is more of a temporary fix, which is probably smart for us. But as you know, for the fire department specifically, that's somewhat under our plan for remodel. This will fix that roof, and it's uh, for a 20-year warranty, which is important. Uh, and as you can see, the three bids, uh, JR and Company, Goddard and Son, and Shepherds, uh, both come, all three came highly recommended from the construction management team, but the best and lowest bid is JR and Company was recommended to be accepted. Is there any way on the fire station to get more trains put in? That, is just one? That's been talked about. It, it apparently uh, is adequate if... If the roof is in the shape that it needs to be in, that's the best answer I have for it because it's been. About, I know Chief would have asked that same question, and it's not to say that we can't put that in later on. The, the water problem that we were having for the basement has been diverted, and so far the rains have uh, stayed. The lot, the, the, the water has stayed out of the basement. So that was one move at the lower end we've done. So now with this uh, with this roofing, they've looked at it, they've inspected it, uh, and. and so far, if they make the repairs, they believe that the terrain and the design is adequate. Now, if it's not later on, then we might have to revisit that, which which will be, as Mr. Whittem, Chief Whittem, had proposed previously, a couple hundred thousand dollar investment in that room, 
and that may come later on. We just don't know. I think we plan for this particular fix, and then if we need to add additional drainage, then we come back with a, a review of what we need and how much money. We have a motion from Council Member Mullen and a second from Council Member Adcox. Shriver. Yes. Adcox. Yes. Mullen. Yes. Bishop. Yes. Mullot. Yes. Item number five to share a bit of work for project CBZ 2024 03 erosion control and site restoration. Thank you, Council. Uh, you have before you the background information on item number five, stock site re restoration at 131 South 10th Street. This goes back quite a long time when we first uh, was under construction for the roundabout. Very simple uh, location in that there was KDHT and KDOT, KDOT. This was a uh, KDOT matching project, therefore they became the lead on that particular project. And when that was declared closed, there were certain actions that they recommended uh, to sidewalks and all of the things and that the city do. And the city did take some of those under advisement and then other things appear to be not have been followed through with. Uh, there appears to be uh, a long-standing uh, evidence uh, from the property owner video, photography, testimony, all of the things that you would want in, in taking on a project like this from a landowner who can then uh, really state and prove a good position that their land was damaged based on some of the actions we did or did not do when it comes to property land erosion. And so we literally a year ago, it's, it's been going on longer than that, but I took over this chair in July of last year. We met soon thereafter with the property owner and her representatives, and we began working with our city engineer and to get a plan that would then uh, you know, rectify some of the, the issues occurring on that property. And within recent weeks, we did finalize a plan. It has 19 different action items that have everything to do with erosion control on the property and, and within this within that same area where water would flow, which might contribute to some of that existing and ongoing potential erosion. And with that, we have discussed that final plan. They have signed off on that final plan. And the last legal piece of document that we would need is a temporary construction easement and or a right of entry, which they've agreed to uh, sign and allow us to do this work. We went out for sealed bids. We received those sealed bids and we opened them up. And I will point out that the engineer's projected cost estimate was $74,745.52. The lowest and best bid that we received was Cohorst Enterprises, $132,410. That there's certainly a difference, as you might note. Uh, not a real, I don't have an explanation, not being facetious in any way, about as to why they missed that. I think uh, certainly some labor costs, some rock hauling, that sort of thing, uh, may have contributed to that. But you do have, as attached, the, the bid tab that was supplied to you. You kind of can track some of the cost uh, where they uh, maybe had more cost associated with their activities rather than what our engineers suggested. However, the work needs to be done. There's a time frame in which we should be doing it. Uh, as we push into fall and, and before winter. Uh, so we recommend that Cohorts Enterprises be awarded the bid for $132,410. And that would be paid for through the Riverview uh, Crossroads Fund, which does have a current balance of $194,056. So there are adequate funds for that. I will close. You should note that 
We have not received a final bill from KDOT. These things take some time. Uh, we don't anticipate that being uh, some absorbent amount. It sounded like it was fully on track. However, no one can say for sure until fiscal gives us uh, that that invoice, if you will, and that could be. It's been a few years now. It could be a few more years. These things do things. These things do take some time. So we're spending money out of that fund where there's adequate money for this particular erosion control. It is somewhat a priority, but I will say that when we spend that fund, we may have to shore that up if there's an invoice from KDI that's more than the remaining. I'll stand for questions. It's possible to send it out for bid again. Comments. And <clears throat> expand a little bit. That's an awful lot of money for construction power up when they built that project. Yeah, and then uh, with them, I kind of want to mention the other side too, where they've taken all that sideline burn down. And they're doing all that. I've got complaints. When we discussed in depth keeping the berm there so you couldn't see the buildings. I'm thinking this project, and then we've got like vacant property up there that's tied up in lawsuits. And all. I think we just got a whole horrible mess up there. And I'm, I'm not, I know the person who with the property, I think everybody in here knows whose property it is, and that needs to be rectified. But this is ridiculous. These overruns keep coming in to us over and over again. Where's this money coming from? <clears throat> You know, we're going to spend this down, and then when something does come up there, we're not going to have the money to take care of it. Eventually, you know, something's going to pop, fortunately for us, maybe, but I'm not sure that. I feel very uncomfortable with this. I think that you try to read it a little bit. Maybe water it down some or something. Can we go back in the original contract? In my word, it's legal. See, most businesses, of course, the government's never run the contract. Uh, you go back to the original contract when I'm mistaken. It's a huge mistake. They should have seen this as a thing. They should have seen this as they were doing the work, you know, today. So they have a problem here. But they didn't say anything. Right? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, the cost of on every single construction job we do, every single one. Every road project is over budget. A lot of had questions. Well, can we do something else? Go back out for bids. And your question was, can we go back on the contractor? Yeah, right. Yeah. So I don't know if there's specific answers. I think we've explored uh, legal ramifications to the degree that we can. Uh, I do think the stormwater permit was issued to the city of Edwardsville. Uh, as far as going, you have choices when it comes to these items. You can make a motion to approve it. To deny it or table it. And with the table, you would give some explanation as what you would expect the staff to do. So those are my options. I'd like to see it tabled and, and then sent out for it. I don't know if it would work or not, but I hope that you can't rather than throwing, you know, half of our money away, you know, and not throwing it away, but spending it somewhere where we shouldn't have to spend it. This is an motion to table item number five by Council Member Block and a second motion from Council Member Adcock. Shriver? Yes. Adcox? Yes. Mullen? Yes. Bishop? Yes. Malott? Yes. Well, I understand the direction is for. Attempt to read it first. No, I think it's just a brief discussion. Can you keep asking to see the pictures of what they could be emailed to us? No, they're their pictures. So I'm just saying. We don't have a camera to go up there and take some pictures of the citizens. Well, we we have there's there's drone footage of the engineers and things like that. But as far as prior to certain times, they've been since day one they've been photographing. Uh, it's, I'm not a professional engineer to say whether or not they've been damaged or not. I just know they have a working problem and we've been trying to solve it prior to my time. So this is where we're at today. And I think and, and the, the direction the staff has is to try to rebid 
and then we can have further discussions based on uh, when you get some of the answers here. I can have engineers here as well. Well, I definitely think it's worth a shot. I mean, you know, we might lose, we might end up having to fight for it. I don't think that we should just sit up here and just automatically approve quality overruns, but that's some kind of tax that's like the furnace the way they are. Because I've been around here a long time and we've never had anything like that. So I don't understand the reason why that's happening. Point of clarification, the money can only be used for crossroads projects. Anything associated with that thing I think about this before we I don't know if there's your staff presentation on the fiscal year 25 budget. I will yield to Mr. Gerber. Everybody, good evening. Uh, nice segue into this discussion, talking about budgeting and being fiscally responsible. Uh, as always, we will start with the budget calendar. <coughs> We've done uh, seven <coughs> sessions so far. <coughs> this meeting is number eight. Uh, next meeting is number nine, and then we have Number 10 on September 9th. So tonight, the intent is to go through the general fund, answer any remaining questions you might have, and then talk about other funds that we may have. Uh, more slides to go on tonight, but I think I'm going to take you there. So I'm rush, but I can, I can do that fairly quickly. So, <coughs> a reminder of our 2025 budget goals that were presented to you and uh, not adopted, but certainly agreed to by consensus. Tax relief, balanced budget, as you recall, I've said this each time over the last five budgets have been uh, deficit budgets. Our question this year was that did not happen. Uh, and we have presented on all occasions a general fund budget that is balanced. Uh, we also want to include the general fund balance, as you know, um, that impacts a lot of things, particularly if it has a little bit of a bond that. Maintain and enhance city services with tangible projects, prioritize the price of our workers, and then uh, promote employee compensation. So, <clears throat> so, this is a big picture, high level overview of the general fund. Before I dive into these, I thought I, I looked for a slide that explained this, and I never found any that really explained to my satisfaction. But I think there may still just be a little bit of um, confusion about what the general fund is. So just to clarify, the general fund is the general operating budget of the city. Uh, it is akin to your, it, it, this isn't a great analogy, but it's similar to your checking account at home, in that in the general fund, you have money that comes in from property taxes, from sales tax, from other miscellaneous revenues, gaming revenues, uh, reimbursed revenues, that all comes into this general fund. We just take the pot. Out of that pot comes expenses for the police department, the fire department, the government body, administration, public works, and so on. So again, it's similar to in your home checking account, you have money that comes in from your retirement, from your residence, from your job. And out of that goes, you know, your car payment, your using skid payments, whatever they have that leave um, housing, mortgage. So it, again, it's not the greatest analogy because the general fund is a big pot out of which come expenses for each department. Each department has a line or a bottom line that overs their responsible um, overs they can't spend over. But it comes out of the big pot. If that makes sense. So just comparing the uh, FY24 budget to the proposed 25 budget, um, expenditures are up in the federal fund by about 560,000, 561,997. Revenues are up in the proposed federal fund budget by almost a million dollars. Now, there's a really simple explanation for that. And the uh, city manager alluded to that earlier. Um, but first of all, it's not a deficit budget, as you can see. The 24 budget was a deficit budget by about 175000 The proposed 25 budget is a surplus budget by 200000 
So we have the fund balance and can decrease the CD's financial position. The reason that you see almost a million dollar increased revenue, again, we're just guessing, right? We're educated guesses, but we're in July slash August of 2024, we're guessing what the budget's going to look like in August of 2025. But these are educated guesses. So the reason that it's up by almost a million dollars is the general sales tax that has the country pass related to the building project for East Fire and City Hall will be about four hundred and fifty thousand. Because that is a general sales tax that passes that money needs to go into the general fund. So there's four hundred and fifty thousand there. Additionally we have pledged to you in such a way that we will increase interest income. And we're suggesting that has a potential to grow up about um, three hundred thousand. So between those two out of that 993750 is, is incorporated into those two specific projects. Um, additionally, on the expenditures, so you have 450000 going in for a half cent general sales tax. In order to pay debt service from that, that money has to go out and pay that service fund. And so of that $561,000 increased expenditures, $450,000 of that, or 80 plus percent of it, is transferring that $450,000 out of the general fund. Make sense? So, again, there's a very big picture overview of what the general fund looks like. In terms of the rest of the expenditures, so 560 minus 450 is about $110,000 in increased expenditures. That's the budget. Increase expenditures, hundred thousand in more a year. That's that's a fair loan budget. That's a that's a status quo budget. There's just not much there. Uh, part of that though it does have to do with payroll and I'll let the city manager. Now you're going to hear back. Of course, you're going to hear back. Um, the payroll I really adopted this as a, as a priority. I know the council uh, over the last few meetings has really talked about this. And, uh, there's no effort to politicize it. I, I just think, once again, uh, a few years ago, we adopted that resolution 2021-06. And that was adopting the step and grade system that we're using now. And one of the priorities in that is consistency in the in the progress uh, of, of the employees from step one, step two, step three, over those years. And so that's the first piece of that resolution. The next piece is about the COLA specifically. And, in odd years, the COLA increase is, is really factored by the consumer price index U, and that, that deals with service workers and, and you know, wage earners from, from more urban areas, which includes the Kansas City metropolitan area. <coughs> uh, but what that says is we don't apply the COLA unless you want to, uh, if, should that CPI index uh, exceed percent Now, there's some argument about what the time frame is and, and that sort of thing, but just in looking on cursory search of it, it's about 2.9%. One of the one of the concerns when we when we <coughs> adopted the resolution 2106, there was a lot of background information of the study that was done to bring up these numbers to say, hey, here's the numbers, here's how we collected them, that sort of thing. But but the analysis of that suggested when we adopt that paid plan, depending on the position that you are are in working in in the city, you were either 7% or 23% in that range of, range of margin there uh, off of the market. So we started out somewhat below the market overall, and we knew that going in. And therefore, if you recall, uh, if you were there at the time, we had work sessions. Uh, we had a work session where the staff, when every time that we talked about this, we, we stressed the importance of a COLA, right? To, to, and the whole basis for a COLA increase is, is an inflationary uh, adjustment. That's what we're doing. We're trying to adjust for inflation. So in this payroll, after assessing all of the, what we've discussed and taking the best approach that ensures that we are still financially healthy, but at the same time, uh, 
doing what we need to do for the employees inflation wise. The step increase is something that's somewhat, yes, it needs your authority, of course. It, it, it seemed to be the message with the goal that that would be automatic. That's why you have step and raise program anyway. And in that resolution, there was a consensus that we would then advance the 3% uh, percent step. So all of those are built on 3%. So from step two to three is a 3% change. So this payroll, which you just heard uh, in, in kind of the high level of the general fund, is everyone advances one step, which which is exactly what we've done over the, over the past few years since we adopted that resolution. And then we looked at a, a different way to approach the COLA. What we usually do is we apply that COLA to the step and grade system. So it takes the entire uh, pay, pay matrix up a full 3%. So then you have the lifetime earnings. It's, it, it, it is more expensive when you do that for every employee across the board because the entire step and grade system is 3% higher, okay? So step one, if it was at a certain rate, that's 3% higher when you add that poll in, okay? So we went back through and applied the COLA as a stipend. So the payroll numbers that you're seeing and the budget that we're presenting is just a simple, a fixed stipend rather than adding the COLA percentage-wise to the step and grade system. It's less expensive. It does the same thing in a lot of ways. However, it doesn't add to some of the benefit costs that we would have right? and the lifetime earnings uh, immediate that, that we would have. So we, we experienced some savings, but we still do what we did somewhat in 2024. We gave a 3% step and, uh, and we gave a COLA that was 3% of the time. And, but we gave that COLA to the entire step and grade system. So what the proposal is, and it fits in this budget, as you see, it wasn't any drastic changes from one year over the year to the next, is that the COLA is applied to every individual, but it's one-time payment rather than over the entire 26 pay periods, and you see it all at once. This is a slow moving step and grade system. It, it, has, it doesn't have incentives built in, what such as longevity or that, it's just, you know, march and step, you know, and that's kind of what you do. So after these few years, we just really haven't seen the progress overall from it. the everyday employee isn't just really seeing it. So this is a better way to apply it this year. Uh, we still reach the goal of taking care of our employees. We have talked about and we have added the longevity pay piece that adds up to about $25,000 for 13 employees, which is pretty good for our 50 plus total employees uh, that hit the three, six and nine year anniversaries. They're hitting that now, and we budget for the next year, so we have it in the budget. And so they will receive their 3% uh, one-time payment for longevity, uh, those 13 employees will. So that's built into the system as well. Now, there's been so much discussion about the pay system, the pay matrix, and, and how we've approached that. Um, what, what I would want to do is let's all get on the same page. Uh, it's somewhat, we just not necessarily reinvent the wheel, but there are so many other beneficial systems that we could be using uh, that such as, that, that, it, that encourages longevity, that rewards uh, good performance, that does these things, that ours is just, again, it's a pocket step. You march from one to two, two to three, that sort of thing. Uh, but this, this would give us an opportunity to have a professional uh, commission to get us market aligned. What is the market? I don't even know, and I've studied this stuff enough. Uh, what is that market that's out there? Uh, one, a system that would support merit and longevity, and be, we'll include and be very transparent in what we're doing with the, so the employees would be well informed and the council would be well informed. So we're almost starting from a, a good playing field, if you will, so that we'll all be informed. We'll do these things formally. Uh, we did not commission a formal study when we adopted this in 2021. That was done in-house, though it was based on other studies. Uh, a professional commission person didn't come in and say, this is what these things are. I do think that in these cases it has some validity, though I would certainly work for a balanced budget as well as, as for the employees as well. I think I would do that fairly. But in a sense, sometimes it's best in these these matters to bring someone in and commission them, and then you hear from the professionals that say, 
Uh, we have a merit, we have longevity, we have this, and this would be the system that you should adopt. And then we'd have full discussion, our employees would be well informed of it. It gives us a chance to kind of reset, if you will. I think that's the best approach. So what this has in it, step increase. Uh, we're keeping we're keeping up with the uh, uh, the, the mission and the goal of the 2106 resolution. We're applying the COLA, but it's a one-time payment. Uh, that when we've done that in the past, which we've done several times over the years, I can speak to it. Uh, that uh, we, we do that at the end of January, so you see it soon in the year, so you have that experience with it. And then again, promoting a future pay system. That's what we're asking for. Uh, we don't need consensus or anything yet today, but that's 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 our direction. That's our goal. This budget includes those things, except for the future pay system, which will have to be devised by our professional advisors. With that, I'll stand for questions. If you have any comments, we're going to move on. All right. Okay, so we started with a broad, big picture overview of the general funds. Now I want to move down into each department that is contained in the general funds. And I've broken down each department into some general categories. This is how we have it broken down in our budget, in our line on detail. And this is how every city I've ever worked in has done it, and most cities across the country. This is how they approach it. So this is very typical best practice. Uh, you can see overall in administration that we have about a $550,000 increase. And you know, the, that number kind of comes out at you, right? At least for your administrators getting their big checks and, you know, getting to all the increases. <coughs> uh, really, this is very explainable. Uh, as we talked about, on the revenue side, we have $450,000 coming in from general sales tax. That has to go out somewhere. So it goes into the administration budget and gets transferred to the debt service. So you can see in that transfer line item, the dollar change is $450,000 as a result of sales tax. And obviously that explains it. The overall increase, um, the other increase, the overall increase, the increase in professional services, engineering, architects, et cetera, big things. Uh, there's lots of places where professional services Questions about this budget? Okay, there's on the core budget. You can see it's uh, about $20,000 overall. Really, the biggest driver of that is a potential insurance change for uh, for employees without getting any specific details. It's something we're trying to plan for in the next when we try it out. But there, there are a couple changes in the open team. Stay for we're not trending at the level we have been in the past. <laughs> you can see in the three services we have in the past. Okay, so we have the fire department. Uh, $2.6 million budget, $36,000 overall increase, well, barely above 1% increase. Uh, yeah, as I was like at the beginning, this is a very status quo budget. <coughs> and people keeping the lights on and doing the services, right? Um, I think it's important to point out there are no additional staff. In fact, three staff were removed, removed from the 24 adopted budget into the 25 proposed budget. So those three trees are not included in the total budget that we discussed. Uh, it doesn't include fire department education pay. Uh, doesn't include the move because that was just taken care of. And the, the biggest increase really is in the services and that's now replacing fire department pay. I'll keep going with the answer questions. This might be a dumb question, but you say there was we budgeted we budgeted last year for three new firefighters. Yes. We decided not to hire them, so the money that we budgeted. Where did it go? You mean for 2024 specifically? Yeah. Um, the, the money doesn't go away in the number on, on the line right? in the sense of if there were $300,000 for three people, for example, that number is still there. We're just not allowing the expenditure. So, so they didn't go anywhere. It's just a number. And hopefully that creates a surplus at the end of the year. And we'll be in a financially healthy position when we will start. 
Parks budget is actually down by sixty-one thousand, but that is it's really just a housekeeping thing. As, as we discussed, we've taken a parks employee, employee that was paid out of parks and moved them to public works because they do a work on the variety of supervision. And so it just felt more sensible to have it in this budget. Um, this does include some new programming and potential for parks. Um, we talked about before just some, you know, the idea of the overall boards or some fishing lead or just those types of things to help enhance services for the citizens of And then finally, public works is a uh, very slight increase of $13,000 to their overall budget. We did take one full time, one part time employee from public works and get them the special highway fund. A lot of cities pay employees that have a special highway fund. Those that's the fund is primarily funded by the city gas tax and any money that they would use for street maintenance. And so a lot of cities do um, fund employees out of their regular budget to provide some assistance to keep that fund working. And we're taking that approach this year. So does this include <laughs> the employee taking <coughs> Before I move on to the other fund, are there any other questions, comments, complaints about the general fund? So as you know, in addition to the general fund, the city has a number of other funds that we budget for in the fiscal year. I'm not presenting all of those funds because some of them is immaterial. Right, but I am presenting what I think is the five most relevant funds for the general fund you know about. If you have others that you have questions about, certainly I'm glad to get you that information in that final session. That's fine, but <coughs> not for now, I'm just presenting these five funds. The first of those is the net fund. Uh, you can see that expenditures are up in the proposed expenditures are up $1.3 million in the debt fund, and that is 100% to do with making sure we cover the cost for potential building of that service. That is obviously the building won't be constructed to finish next year, but we will have to bring notes and we will have to start making payments on that. And so we just want to make sure that we're covering and we're working on those things. I do not believe it will be the unfortunate thing, but also. See the revenues were up a little bit over a million, four hundred and fifty thousand of that is from the general absent sales tax of four hundred and fifty thousand, special absent sales tax of nine hundred thousand, and just overall increases in sales tax generally are accounting for that additional three thousand. Mr. Yes. On all these funds, you're expecting for this sales tax to pass. Correct. We did that once before. No nine got fixed. Remember the parking here? Yeah. We did that when we have a cash in sales tax. We got fixed. It was what, three times that we had to be coming back to four times. Three. Three. Yeah. I don't know, man. Our approach is we budget these things and then they don't come to fruition. There's not an expenditure or a revenue. So right, these are just we're preparing. <clears throat> this is the picture. And if, if something changes, we have to do it before November. You don't want to surprise it and then have to scramble around and make all these amendments. So we're, we're 
overuse the word maybe, but preemptively doing this. So you can see that there's an impact to the general fund, there's an impact to the debt fund, and the both as revenue and as expenditure. So it's the right approach, quite frankly. The other thing I would say is in different cities I've been at, there have been different approaches to that. Some cities don't budget for those things that they know aren't going to happen or aren't for sure will happen. And they make an amendment and the fiscal year ends. My preference is to do it this way. I think it's more transparent. It yes. this better. All those things. But there is another approach. Uh, special highway funds, again, that is uh, funded through uh, state gas tax. You can see there's a giant increase in expenditures, and that is, again, just a reflection of a philosophy. And my philosophy on these kinds of funds is that you can budget the maximum expenditures so that you have flexibility, so that you have the ability to do the erosion control, so that that means street or sidewalk comes up and have the ability to be responsive to it. Um, and yes, the philosophy, but that's how I am always approached things. So, as I know in the, the text there, it does include uh, a significant increase in street maintenance, which is a possibility, includes some funds for public works equipment, like a skid steer that's uh, apparently about 100 years old and needs to be replaced. Um, those kinds of things. And again, it's, it's uh, it doesn't see fundable money in the moved from the general fund. So. The thing I don't know about it is that it's a deficit budget. This is what you're doing. But again, you know, budgeting the maximum amount of expenditures and those are likely. Uh, what we call the special sales tax fund. I think what we need to call the sci-fi fund. No, that was a higher one. Oh, sci-fi. Yeah. Social sales tax fund. Still, you know, still running. It's been a long time. Um, this also includes a higher than normal level of expenditures and does include uh, funding for the parks and for the books and other things. Um, the one big asterisk in this fund is we do have the potential of losing. Some funding from special, special yeah. Yeah. yeah, reverse that. So, yeah, yeah that should run around the Like, we do have, <clears throat> I think you're probably aware that why not County's been talking about um, potentially pulling back some of their sales tax support of the cities. So, that happens, and obviously, we need to protect it. Next two are kind of uh, boring funds, obviously, solid waste and sewer, but they're also very vital to the development of the land of community. Um, you can see that this is another deficit fund, and that we are uh, budgeting more expenditures than there is. Uh, the one comment I would make, I think everybody's aware of this, but this contract we have for solid waste is not a pro city contract. <clears throat> By that I mean, by contract, the city is required to pay the full amount of the cost of the service, whether or not we collect all that revenue or not. So, say it's five bucks a month for each of you, we're required to pay twenty-five dollars, and if three of you decide not to pay, we we'll only give you ten dollars. Doesn't matter; we're still required to pay twenty-five dollars. So you put that in the aggregate, and, and that's frankly what's happening. And it's challenging to shut off their service because then <coughs> all these things, right? Then the trash is collected and <coughs> the whole thing can happen in other names. I mean, it's just it's a complicated situation. I think everyone's aware that it's not a good situation that needs to be addressed, but that's why it's a deficit. And you may have questions of when can we do that? When can we address this contract? We have another year. So we'll be dealing with that. We started. Last July, the first time I saw the numbers close to like 396, 398, somewhere almost four hundred thousand dollars in uncollected revenue uh, payments for that. We're down to the 149 now. So it was a year of uh, proactively 
using the ordinance and our payment plans, whatever we could do to make these payments. Because in the end, I think the best way to define this is a poor contract for the city. And you know, that should be it. In the future, what we should focus on is if they want to do business with us and be an exclusive contract, they can do it all. This is not a money maker. This is not like our sewer, some other utility electric or whatever. This is, we pay 100%, whether we collect 100% or not as we go. It's not due yet. But we look. <coughs> We're anticipating. We're ready. <laughs> In the last uh, uh, overview, I wanted to get my sewer funds. I'm going to use this as a deficit funds. Um, and that is largely to do with increased expenditure costs for the sewer maintenance. Uh, every time. It's not Brian's fault. He's inherited much of this, but the fact is, it's it's out there, and uh, we have a sewer backup that's broken, and so we want to try to come out of that first. Try to start having folks in the press. a lot of numbers fairly quickly and we will have another session at the uh, what was that, 2016 or kind of questions but I just want to run into that. What is your projection for the increase in the funding? Sort of like 707 something like that? Mm -hmm. Lack of better word. Starting the year about 845,000. And if we spend, you, you notice the expenditures versus the revenue. That's a deficit of 175,000. It's a start. Nothing else changed. We spent as much as we said we we're going to spend, and we generated the exact revenue. You mentioned about the rainy day fund. That's, this is where this comes from. I know, but how much are we going to turn out? Well, we started the year audited. $845,000. So are we going to be adding anything to that? If, as I was saying, if you spend more than you make, you will deficit spend. Our projection right now is 699000 at the end of 2020. Yes. Yeah. Well, the proposed 25 budget actually adds quarterly. <clears throat> Where we are in reality is we set a budget that actually spends more than projected revenue by 175000 So if you have 845 in the bank and you spend into that, you have less than that. Does anybody else up here have a problem with that? I do. Because we could be going down from triple A minus, we could be going down, you know, the further we spend that down, the more the spending is. All money. Just like your credit rating. The more your credit rating goes down, the higher that car loan is, the house loan is going to The picture is as we pay you. Now, if we control expenses and we generate the revenue at least as what we projected or more, we're in a better, healthier position. And our job here is to get us financially healthy. We'll, we'll worry about the wealth later, right? Right now, these strategies of reducing personnel, our primary cost, right, and controlling expenses so that the departments are within their boundaries of what they expected to spend, and even less now because we've said don't spend anything. We, we, this is a very concerted effort to control this thing. So at the end of the year, we don't have 699000 we have more. I cannot guarantee you that because right now I have a budget that says I'm going to spend 175000 more than I'm going to make. And if I do that, that's a deficit spending.
Um, I have nothing further to report. Other than, let me talk, sorry, quickly sci fi. I did get a message that that was being heavily considered for, which is a quarter mil from the county. Remember, it took us years to get that back on the books. And that goes to specifically, we deposit that in special highway because it's infrastructure money. Now, that's, that potentially could be, oh, well, it's highly potential. It's on the chopping block, if you will, for lack of a better word. Um, I understood from the messages that maybe. It could be just for one year, and then could be reconsidered. That's uh, it's being discussed more than likely as we speak right now. So it's, it's this is the third time that it's been proposed at the county side, which is the sheriffs and any of the election office and some of the other folks, uh, because of revenue neutral that they may need that money back just to be able to. So that's very possible, and that's all. Council member Eckhart. A couple of things. I did mention that Durham refused to contact the inspector from the Skinnell. Skinnell. They have a contractor up there. But yes, I did review the plan. I spoken to the beyond general manager uh, that, in a sense, it appears they have no plans to restore that burn. In fact, there was some suggestion that was originally there and they left it there because it was part of the road project. But now that the building project has moved forward, two of them, uh, that they have taken the burn out and somewhat the level that you see it at now, that whole stretch which would be their, their west side, if you will, of that project, will be at ground level. The west side there east. Yeah, it would be, yeah, our, and that was a major contention when we were dealing with them on that, but they made a sideline. Now, I don't know if that ended up in the development agreement. There was no confidence that from them that they were required to do that at all. So that's, mm -hmm. that's what I know. Well, I know that all the residents up there wanted to have to be there so we didn't look at the project plan. And there was also a rumor out there that they were going to take out the <coughs> room out. They were going to do what I'm sorry. There was a rumor, just strictly rumor, that they were going to remove that mound now. But that was the We might have kind of looked into that. Well, I mean, it's a rumor, a rumor, there was a rumor. I mean, it wasn't they. Could they put $15 million to the city of Edwardsville? Yeah, well, maybe. Right? A couple of things. I wanted to request, and I always bring this up because sidewalk, sidewalk, sidewalk. Just work on Dollar General. Sidewalk, the talking safety for pedestrians and all that, wheelchairs, motorized will have around and all that. These people need to be able to access the store that we have in town, which is the Dollar General. Yes. I was on that on the sideline crossing and we were out on the CPO on the sidewalk. The other thing is, uh, well, K32, yeah, I like Um, I wanted to say at the last change monitor at the Bill Chamber luncheon, which was, was it last week or two weeks ago, I wanted to compliment uh, city manager and Mike Martin. I did a presentation on kind of the state of the city uh, with the chamber from Mark and then the uh, autumn test, kind of a review of what's going to be coming up on the autumn test. And uh, Mike Martin to me is really going about it. So if you don't know what the plans are on that and schedule on that, you need to look at it because it's going to be pretty, pretty wild. I think the safety folks, congratulations to see that. Appreciate the budget hearing for the budget presentation. It, uh, I'm looking at it a little bit more negatively. I can't look at that with rose colored glasses. I'm, I'm in agreement with Mr. Bishop. On this seven percent, then or whatever. Oh, we got this have tornado come through here, or a major fire, or something, and we're going to be out of that by the next day. I mean, that's that's not protected. Thank you. Mr. Bishop, 
you know, maybe we can boost our sewer fund. And I try to get Mike to do this. But Honor Springs wants to hook up to our sewer for those buildings. The two buildings are built right now. And Mike said, oh, we can't charge him this. I said, Mike, it's our sewer. So I said, you charge him, start out at $25 million, $5 million a year. That's a little bit high, obviously. It's, it's a negotiated piece for the president. And I don't understand why he gave it away. If we have an interlocal agreement that's already established, we'll get the prices off. Well, next time we say, isn't Bucky said it's an investment? It's on, it's, I'm scheduled to meet with them fairly soon. We're going to be talking about this meeting. They're, they're representative engineering. Right. So that's what I would explain to somebody. There's a big case of the quality of the heat or something. Get to it. It's not a something. Let me just throw that out there. Let me just go to it. I just have a few comments. I am um, in full support of the case study, outside case study, and how it's sat here. I felt that way. I'll never understand. It's been 110. But I, I know a couple of neighbors talked about it, said it was a lot. So Great. Hopefully it was a, it was a good turnout. I wasn't able to see much down there, but I um, did hear good feedback. So right. thank you for every, everybody that was involved. I it was a great turnout. I would say the sheriff's department told me that they gave out 350 hot dogs, so we had at least that there. So. And ran out. And ran out <laughs> about 30 minutes before we were done. So. Something for those kids to look forward to. And um, I'll echo what Council Member Malak said. Um, Autumn Fest is going to be exciting. It always is a great production, but um, I do know Mike puts, in, Mike puts in a lot of time and a lot of effort. And I will ask to be but that on the left side, if there is any to make it, it's not, and somebody maybe gets some. We've been advertising. I know there's sign. I know there's been advertising. Yes. Going on, but we're doing hard signs. We're, do, we're just trying to we're, we encourage the, the uh, chamber of commerce to be more involved in the advertisement piece. That's really where we need them because they have such a reach. Uh, because I think that's been our deficiency a little bit over the past. It's not well advertised. <clears throat> so any any media that we can use, we're doing. It. So um, I would suggest. Um, Maybe a little blurb and stuff with the grace period. That way, I mean, I think kids go back to the So, 16. maybe some information can get sent home or sent to their parents. So, that would be uh, more advertisement. Yes. I just have one thing on the, the grant for life. It was the third or fourth time somebody was asked or requested information about it. That grant for a million dollars, it's not money to the city that we're built. This is a grant to do some analysis of high injury intersections throughout Wyandotte County. So it's a countywide grant so that this professional company can, can assess high injury uh, traffic areas. And then from that, they devise a strategy uh, to then reduce opportunities, maybe environmental changes, whatever traffic, uh, you know, traffic lane change, whatever it might be, stoplights. That's what that's for. There's no million dollars, none of that's coming to the city of Edwardsville money wise, but K32 and 98th Street, where we from experience, we've had plenty of major injury, if not several fatality accidents. That will be one of those areas in which they'll study whether a stoplight is necessary. That's what this kind of thing is. High injury traffic areas. Okay. I pushed for that with Martin Long, chairman of the uh, transportation committee. He couldn't get it done because they had a road kit. 
That was their email. <laughs> oh, I'm like, Mark, I'm sorry. Yeah, I got back there because I missed one. Because uh, you reminded me when you said 32, I know that. Um, I have had people complain about maybe trying to upgrade a pedestrian crossing across 32 Iowa at the street. So we have a sidewalk on this side, and you walk the grass, and then the other side, you can take notes. Maybe the shade docks could take a little look at that. Maybe if they have storm traffic down the run through there, 60 miles per hour, you can go over that wall. 32 hours, definitely. Thank you.